If you subscribe to the channel, you'll get lots of interesting videos like this one. And if you like the video, it'll really help us out. Please comment down below for any other interesting things that also really helps us out as well. Hi, welcome to another edition of Easy Theory. So today we're going to start an advanced theory class or set of lectures, I guess. So today we're going to be talking about quotient languages. And what are those? So let's suppose that I have two languages, L1 and L2. So these are languages. Then what I'm going to define L1 divided by L2 is to be all the strings of the form uh, x, such that there exists a y in uh, L2, such that x, y is in L1. So in some sense, what we're doing here is we're taking the string y from the language we're dividing by and taking it away from those strings in uh, L1, okay? So uh, just to give you an example, so here's an example, and I invite you to actually prove that this is true. So let's let L to be all the perfect squares, or, or the strings of length a perfect square, and and they're all um, they're all zero. Strings are all zeros here. Then we, we could, in theory, divide it by divide the language by itself. So this is actually, if we think about it for a second, this is all the strings of the form zero to the the number k, such that k is equal to n squared minus m squared for some uh, for some integers n and m. Okay, so uh, even though that this language isn't regular, uh, just as an example, this language is regular because you can actually show that uh, we can decompose uh, this particular language into two sets, namely uh, 0, 0, 0 star, so all the strings of odd length, and then union all the strings that are a multiple of 4. And I invite you to actually uh, figure out how to actually prove that in the comments. But anyway, so this is the quotient um, operation. So we take two languages, and we look at both of them, and we say, we're going to take all the strings basically from L1, because the x part came from L1, and we're going to, if there's some suffix of the string, the end of the string, if that end of the string is in L2, we're going to stick the, the rest of the string, the prefix, into the front of the, into the language L1 divided by L2. So it's kind of a like division, although it's not really division because we're only dividing one choice of, of y out. Although there could be many choices of y, for each one of them, we're going to look at all the strings that have that suffix and put them in. If there isn't a y in L2, then the x is not put into this language. Okay, so I want to prove something for you right here. So let's let um, R be a regular language, so just any old regular language, and let L be any language. Not even uh, regular, not even context-free, it could be any language at all. Okay, then what we'll do here is we will show, okay, what's happening? I might have to edit this out. All right, so then R divided by L is regular. Okay, so it's actually important that um, the first language here in the division is the regular language, and the second one could theoretically be anything. So if in, this actually tells us if both of them are regular, then obviously this is regular, because uh, the first one's regular, and the second one can be anything that you want, any language that you want. It could be an undecidable language if you wanted to. So this is actually a really interesting example because it tells us that we can show this 
by producing a DFA for it, but not knowing any properties of the DFA at all. I can assert that there exists a DFA for it, but I can't actually uh, produce it for you. Okay, so uh, here's how we're going to prove this. So remember, the division operation says, um, look at some string, uh, like any string in this regular language right here, and we're going to see if there is a suffix of that string that belongs in, in L, then we'll just take the, the first piece of that string. So what we can actually think about is, let's let M be a DFA for R. Because we know it's regular, there is a DFA for it. So what will we actually do here? Then all that we're going to do the only thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, change the final states of that machine M to be, and so here's the important part, uh, all states is going to be all states uh, Q in that machine M such that if we uh, read some string uh, y in that in that arbitrary language l and end in a final state okay so if i read any string at all from this language if there exists a string y such that from this state q we hit that state it hit a final state we're going to mark Q as a final state. Um, and I actually should mention here that this right here, I should say previously final state. So if I could go to what was a final state before, then I'm going to mark Q as now being a final state. So the final states are going to change potentially, but it's just that um, the final state here is not the same as this final state here. And we can actually uh, get an intuitive reason why that's the case. So let's actually think about this. Let's think about this. So if we read some string uh, from the start state, and we read the string, and we ended in some final state somewhere, okay? And we have this uh, pesky state in the middle, uh, which is called Q. And from this state Q, we could read that string y to get to that final state. That's what this is saying right here. Well, let's, in, let's actually look at the part that took us to that uh, q state to begin with. I'm going to call that part x. Well, isn't that saying that there exists a y such that um, x, y is in the first language, the regular language? Well, the x, y is in here. so for each prefix, this state right here has some way of getting to it from the start state. So if we can go from Q0 through this state right here and end up in a final state, and some part of the end right here was in the second language, the, the language L right here, then the first part needs to be inserted into the quotient language, which means that this string X needs to be accepted which means that this state needs to be final. And that's actually a proof. So the thing is, that from this, we actually don't know what the DFA looks like. Well, we know what the states and the transitions look like. We, we know that. But we don't know anything about the final states because it depends on the language L itself. It could be that none of the states are final, or all of them are. But it's just that... Um, we don't know anything about what the final states are. So this is a non-constructive proof. Yeah, so, th that, so that's a term that we use all the time. Non-constructive proof. So I, I can't actually make the DFA for you um, without knowing anything about the language L. But I know it exists because I can tell you 
how to do it if you know the strings of L in advance. If you know what they are, then you can figure out what the final states are. But uh, I can't actually tell you the exact procedure on which of the final states are actually final, or, or which of the states are final. So isn't that kind of weird? Uh, leave your thoughts down below. But yeah, this actually proves something interesting that um, uh, not only are regular languages closed under quotient, but they're closed under quotient with any language at all, even an undecidable language. So this is actually quite interesting. And it's a really interesting property of closure for regular languages. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave additional thoughts down in the comments. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel. We just started channel memberships, so if you want to support the channel further, uh, you can go do that. And as always, I'll see you next time.